Hi, everyone. So welcome to the third session here at the Almadina track. So uh, right now we are going to have Nathaniel uh, Shuta. Is that you right? got it? Well done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Nate. Um, so we are you are going to present responsible microservices. Uh, that that's going to be uh, well interesting uh, to say the least because everyone is doing microservices, but uh, most of people think microservices are uh, small domain uh, services. <laughs> so and sometimes they go for a surprise. Uh, so let's see how it goes. <laughs> that sounds Go good. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. And thanks to all of you for joining us here today. Uh, good afternoon, I believe, if, if I can do math, which is always a little questionable for me, uh, even on the best of terms here. But so I, I before I jump in, I'll point out I've got a couple of these little report things that I've written over the last couple of years. One more on how I think about architecture. This is kind of where I've lived for the last decade plus. But the one that's probably most relevant to, to you, if you're listening to me here today, is, is this one. So the, the material, as, as I was saying in the pre-show, the material here is something that grew out of work with, with some clients. And I turned that into a blog series, which well, I thought it was just going to be a blog. And then the person who was kind of my editor on that's like, hey, this is really good. Can we do more? And I'm like, well, I guess. And then I turned that into a presentation. Then I kind of sort of morphed that into this report because I figure it's a lot easier just to get a PDF than it is to try to go, you know, searching through all these different web links. So if you're interested in what I'm talking about today and you missed something I said, or you want to have a repeat of it, you want a prose variant of it, you can just go snag this from us and enjoy. Now, I've lived in this cloud space now for a lot of years. And what you realize pretty quickly is there's a lot of options here. And Unfortunately, for better or worse, an awful lot of developers have internalized this, I would say, false notion that, well, the cloud must mean microservices, that if I'm, if I'm on the cloud, I have to be in microservices. And so we spend a lot of time talking about domain-driven design. You know, people have finally dusted off their copies of Eric's book. It's somewhere on the shelf behind me. We're looking for bounded contexts and we're, we're trying to form ubiquitous languages and we're getting everybody together on a two pizza team, but I feel like we've missed a step. And so to paraphrase my favorite fictional chaos mathematician, your developers were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And undoubtedly that has led to some pain. If you look at the call structure of a lot of these microservice architectures, it looks a little something like this. And there's a reason why we call this the Death Star architecture. You know, I think this is why Death Stars kept blowing up, right? And, and so we go down this path, we think it's gonna solve all our problems. And then we've run into this big ball of pain. And we're like, you know, oops, maybe this wasn't the best idea. Maybe, maybe there's another way, maybe there's a better way. And it's not that microservices are inherently good or bad, they just are, it's a series of trade-offs. I mean, that's what architecture is in a nutshell, is these trade-offs between this option and that option. You know, I, I, liked, I, I taught a graduate school class last year on architecture and what I tried to sort of repeat to them again and again and again is it depends that all of these decisions that we make are by definition hard. If they were easy, they would have already been made. And so it's important to understand that there are good reasons to adopt microservices, but we as technologists have to understand what those trade-offs are and that there are no free lunches here. So if we go down this path, we gain quite a number of things and we'll talk about several of them here today, but I've also added complexity to the equation. And that might be acceptable if I actually benefit from that. If, if I'm getting something out of that equation, then, then that's cool. But software is hard enough, I don't need to make it harder just because. And so one of the soapboxes that I've been on for the last couple of years is trying to get developers to think in terms of when should we use microservices as opposed to just assuming, well, obviously everything will be a microservice all the time. Now, I refer to this as responsible microservices. I think when it first went up as a blog, it was called, should that be a microservice? Uh, you know, it's always funny to see how people decide to change your headlines as you write these things. But let's start with a level set of what do we even mean by microservices? There's a lot of, of I would say, sort of this uncertainty and doubt and FUD that gets thrown around around what this means. And I would say, first and foremost, a microservice is really just a reaction 
to the monolith and the pain that the monolith typically brings to the party, as well as these sort of heavyweight SOA-y things that we've done for a lot of years. And it's also just a reaction to the fact that the cloud lets us do some really interesting things that we couldn't do before. I, I had a friend on my Twitch stream on Monday, and one of the things I mentioned there is, if you would have had the idea for microservices 15 or 20 years ago, and you would have gone to your infrastructure people and said, listen, I want to spin up, I don't know, let's just say a thousand instances of the app server in every region, they, their heads would have exploded and they would have said, you're, you're crazy. There's no way we can do that. Now, obviously your app server vendor would have been pretty happy about that because that would have been a lot of extra licenses. The reality is monoliths aren't a lot of fun typically. And, and that's not a, a, a viable sort of requirement of the monolith. It just tends to be how we structure these things. I've been on a lot of monoliths. Productivity isn't always excellent. It, it can be fairly plodding along. It's hard to get your head wrapped around these massive code bases. When you join these teams, it can take you weeks, months, years, in some cases to truly get up to speed. You know, and I've pondered quite a bit about why have we done these traditional quarterly releases. And I think a lot of it boils down to, for most of our software career, it, it changing just one small thing. I still need to deploy everything anyway. And so I might as well wait till I have a big batch of things to deploy together. Because if I'm going to go through the pain of deploying, I might as well have enough there to justify doing that. Scaling meant I had to scale the entire application. I couldn't just scale up the part that needed it, which in many instances gives us this single digit server utilization, which is not awesome. These systems can be really hard to evolve and, and we're all familiar with the second law of thermodynamics. This came up at some point in your educational career, otherwise known as a teenager's bedroom. I am the proud owner of a teenager. He is sleeping, I'm sure very pleasantly below me. He's actually one room over and at some point during this pandemic, I was taking something out of his room or putting something in his room, and I had a really hard time figuring out where the floor was. And so I suggested to my wife that perhaps we should ask the young lad to clean up his room. And she looked at me and said, what hill do you want to die on today? And I recognized not that one. Now, as much as I wish my son's room was more organized, he's just adhering to the second law of thermodynamics, the universe wants to be disordered. Now, I'd love to say that software is somehow immune from these forces, but it's not. We've all started on a new project and uttered some variant of this time, we're going to do it right. Only to get six months in and the streams have crossed and the package boundaries aren't clean anymore and somebody did something goofy and, and now we're just tearing out our hair going, why? Why did we do this to ourselves? You know, modularity tends to break down over time. It takes longer and longer and longer to add new functionality. And that makes our customers kind of grumpy. And I think it's this whole combination of things that has ultimately given birth to this new architectural style. And I say new because none of these things are really new. We tend to just sort of take something, you know, change the name slightly, dust it off a little bit, give it a slightly different slant and, and here you go. And thus was born the microservice. Now it's important to understand there's no one definition here. You know, there's lots of arguments around that. It really very much is in the eye of the beholder. You'll know it when you see it. And, and by the way, the important definition is the one that exists within your organization. So that when you are talking amongst your teammates and you say microservice and your teammates as microservice, you're on the same page. You know, and I know we love to argue in this industry, especially about terms. And this is one of my all-time favorite tweets. This is my old boss, Andrew Clay Schaefer, who wants to argue about the definition of made up words with me. He's absolutely right. We spent a lot of time doing that. Now, I'm rather partial to anything that reminds us these things are supposed to be small. So anything that can be rewritten in two weeks or less seems to fit that bucket fairly well. If I make a mistake, a lost an iteration, I can recover from one lost iteration. Now that does beg a fascinating question. How big should a microservice be? And this is a fantastic video that Sam put out last year. It's short, it's eight minutes, well worth your time. And Sam makes a fascinating argument. He says, over time, it will be smaller because you will gain the muscle memory, you will get the tooling in place that it is easier to do and thus you will make them smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, there's also that argument that says, oh, they should be as, as small as possible and no smaller, you know, which is not always the most easy to understand or, or most obvious way of doing this. So well worth eight minutes of your time to watch Sam's video. Some people talk about this in terms of two pizza teams. It's anything that can be rewritten, rewritten or can be written by a two pizza team. And 
that's fine. I, I don't have any issues with the two pizza team concept. However, it doesn't give us any guidance around how many services can that two pizza team handle? Now, this was a real question that a director came to me with my previous organization said, Nate, we're, we're doing all this microservice stuff. We're forming all these two pizza teams, but how many services can they handle? And I told him, well, it depends. And he didn't like that answer. But of course, it does depend. If these services are very volatile, oh, okay, well, this team can probably only handle a very small number of them, three, four, five. If these services are very stable, very refined, they're not changing a lot, that exact same group of developers might be able to handle 10 or 15 or 20. I think it's more important to look at these in terms of characteristics. These are a suite of small, focused services. They do one thing, they do it well. It's that Linux, Unix concept of let's take simple tools, pipe them together to get complicated results. They should be independently deployable. This gets violated surprisingly often. A friend of mine was telling me that he was in a situation where they had this set of services. There were seven of them. If you modified any of the seven, you had to deploy all seven of them in the proper order. Otherwise, the databases wouldn't initialize properly. Oops. They can be independently scalable. They can evolve at different rates. The thing that gets developers really excited is, oh, I can choose the right tech for the job, which unfortunately we tend to morph into, thank goodness I can finally justify using insert esoteric technology here. These are built around business capabilities and, and they are a perfect encapsulation of what I refer to as the zeroth law of computer science, which is high cohesion, low coupling. And if you think about so many of the things we're trying to do in software, so many of the things that we have, inside of the gang of four patterns or other other patterns sort of material it's really about high cohesion low coupling often just at different levels of abstraction and so i would say microservices are high cohesion low coupling applied to services at the end of the day friends it's a style it's an approach it's a pattern it is not mjolnir it will not solve every problem you've ever had i'm sorry and I do realize that's the way many of us of developers have phrased it, that, oh, finally, this will solve our issue. This is the silver bullet I've been searching for. I'm going to prove Brooks wrong, as I've heard some people say to me before. The end of the day, they're just tools. And we have to look at them as tools. And we have to know when to use which tool. Now, I'm a software person at heart. I'm not very good at hardware in any sense of the matter. I'm not a particularly handy individual around the house. And so a couple of years ago, when my wife thought, you know, I think we should probably finish our basement. I said, that's a great idea, but I'm certainly not going to do it. it. It will never get done and it won't be of sufficient quality. And so we hired some folks to do the work. And the people that worked on my basement, they, they didn't just have one hammer. They had an entire truck full of hammers. You know, if you've ever gone to a, a big box sort of home retail kind of store, they have an aisle full of hammers. You know, and some are bigger and some are smaller and some are heavier and some have, you know, kind of a knurled face and some don't. And, you know, some are great for tearing down a wall and some are great for doing finish work. You know, and, and so you, you could try to use a sledgehammer to, to put up some nice maple trim, but it's not going to end well. You know, you're probably going to break a thumb. You're going to dent up your, your nice trim and it's just not going to be a pleasant experience. And so the challenge for us is when do I pick up this tool? When, when does this make sense? And so it's on us to use them wisely. And it's also important to understand that microservices aren't the only choice we have. I love this quote from Simon Brown. If you can't build a monolith, what makes you think microservices are going to be any easier? And Matt Stein had a great set of tweets here recently. This one really resonated for me and clearly a number of other people. Large monoliths are unmaintainable. No, they're not. Poorly structured systems are unmaintainable. It doesn't matter how you deploy them. He's absolutely correct. Now, I was having a conversation with Spencer Gibb, and, and he sort of helped me kind of crystallize this concept. And so I, I tipped the hat to him for this slide. But we have this idea of modularity, and then we have deployability. And so many of us are in this unfortunate scenario where we have the most common of all patterns, the big ball of mud, even though it's probably the most loathed architectural pattern we use. And so we have neither modularity nor distributability. And so we look at the big ball of mud and we say, oh, this isn't a lot of fun. And then we see microservices and we go, whoa, that's Nirvana. It is distributable. It is modular. I want to migrate my big ball of mud to microservices. That sounds awesome. Except that's not what happens. We create a distributed 
big ball of mud. And this, friends, is the worst of all possible worlds. Do not do this. We get all the complexity of trying to make this thing distributable, you know, all that extra jazz that comes along with these highly distributed architectures, but we don't actually get the benefits that come along with the modularity. So it's really in our best interest to migrate this to a modular monolith first and, and take that effort, do that refactoring. And then from there, if it makes sense, migrate to microservices. And by the way, this tends to make it a lot simpler to figure out, well, I wonder where the bounded contexts are. I wonder where those domains switch over. You know, I wonder where the seams are in my architecture. That tends to work better from a modular monolith as opposed to doing that from the big ball of mud in the first place. Now, some people these days will talk about right size services or macro services. And, and again, I think this is just us trying to triangulate on what's the right size for this particular situation, for this application, for this team. And that's going to be different from team to team, from, from scenario to scenario. In some cases, it, you know, what you might think is too big, I might think is too small and vice versa. And that's perfectly fine. We need to be ruthlessly pragmatic about these things. And so some teams are taking their modular monolith and making more, more coarser grain services, or they're taking some of their microservices and maybe refactoring them back together into something coarser grain. And that's, again, perfectly reasonable. You know your domain best. You know your situation best. I love this tweet as well. This is certainly a sentiment that I have, have put out into the universe multiple times. You don't have to use microservices to be cloud native. There are cloud native monoliths. That is often the right choice. And again, especially early on when we know the least. So don't be afraid to say, you know what? I don't think we're quite ready for microservices. We don't need to jump straight into that. And yes, sometimes these are the right choices. Now, this presentation is going to try to give you some of the keys where microservices make sense, where we actually get some benefit from that. And so one of the first things we look for is multiple rates of change. So Almost without exception, when you look at your systems, you're going to find that, that some parts of the system change all the time and others, frankly, haven't changed in months or even years. And so if you're in a scenario where some parts need to move at different speeds, microservices can give you some lift here. So if we have this mythical widget.io monolith, you know, typical ordering system where there's a recommendation engine, an account, inventory cart, et cetera. Well, let's be honest, as we look at this as technologists, that cart module is probably not changing very often. You know, you add things to the cart, you take things out of the cart, maybe how we calculate tax has to change as the tax code evolves. But, you know, by and large, the cart itself hasn't evolved very often. And we probably don't have any control over the inventory system because, you know, that's probably some third party warehouse thing that we don't have any way of tweaking but you know what? Our customers really want the recommendation engine to be better. And I've never once had a customer tell me, you know what? Search is just too darn good, Nate. You know, can you make search suck a little bit? People are finding what they want too easily. Now, the challenge of the monolith is everything had to move at the same rate. And I do believe this is why we traditionally relied on quarterly releases because well, you know, releases hurt and we don't want to do it very often. And besides, we want to build a justified doing that effort. So let's wait until we have a whole bunch of changes together because somehow that's easier. And, you know, I have to push the whole monolith anyway. And, you know, now putting aside the fact that we often then got locked in these wonderful windowless conferences. I don't know who decides conference rooms should be windowless all the time. Trying to figure out which of the many hundreds, if not thousands of changes caused the build break that we're all experiencing. And it's like, well, I don't know, there's a whole bunch of them and who knows how they all weave together. It seems like if we only pushed a couple of changes, it'd be a lot easier to do these root cause analyses. Now, luckily for us today, we have options. Today, we can actually split things apart such that the pieces that iterate or can or need to iterate more quickly can do that. And so we might decide to refactor this and say, well, let's pull the recommendation engine out as its own microservice and let's pull search out as its own microservice. And now they can go at whatever pace makes sense for them. And more importantly, that means I can get some business value into production more quickly. That's really what this game is all about. You know, we might be very excited about the technology, some new, new toy that we're playing with, but our customers want features and functionality delivered to production as quickly as possible. So how do I know what changes faster than the rest of our system? Well, trust your gut. There's a pretty good chance that you have an inkling already of what moves more rapidly in your own system. So, so don't dismiss what your instincts are telling you. But it's also really good to have some data. All right. So we can start with the most basic thing we have, which is our source code management tool. 
you know, if you look at your source code management tool, you can actually get a heat map just by looking at history. So Git gives you a lot of very powerful ways of seeing what's going on. So you can use a command like this to say, hey, show me what my top 10 list is. So at some point in the past, I ran this against Spring, which to be very clear is not a monolith, but you know, it's an easy code base for me to get my hands on. So that worked out well. And so I was looking at this one day and I'm like, oh, wow, the change log changes a lot. Like who could have predicted that? Like, what are the odds? Now, I don't know enough about the ins and outs of Spring to tell you whether or not the configuration class parser changing a lot is expected or not. You know, every time I look at this slide, I think I should really run this by someone on the team to say, hey, you know, does this mean much to you? Like, does this, does this worry you at all? And, and it, it's probably not. It's probably just what they would expect. But this will give you a place to start. This will give you an initial sort of location to start digging around and practice what many of us spend a lot of our career doing, which is software archaeology. So we can start rooting around in the code base, you know, or as I like to say it, roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, and, and apologies to Sir Isaac Newton, but we're looking for smoother pebbles and prettier shells, or what Michael Feathers refers to as churn. And now Michael looked at this in terms of, well, where should we refactor? And the reality is your code, like so many things in this universe, are going to adhere to a long tail pattern. You're going to have some files that are updated all the time. You know, three minutes ago, it was updated. Now, the others, we haven't even looked at this since we put the initial commit out there. Now, Chad Fowler took this, this concept and matched it with complexity to create this idea of turbulence. Now, there are code forensic tools that we can leverage. And, and you know, to be very clear, I don't sell any of these. I don't have any, any dogs in this fight. And so I simply show this to you just as an example of what some of these tools can do. And as I was doing research, I found this thing called Code Scene. Again, I, I don't work on this. I've never used it in anger, but I use it as an example of things that we can get by, by pointing some tooling at our code base. I like this one because it's kind of visual and I'm a visual person. But you, you start to see some hot spots in your code base and you can start drilling into it and you can start to say, okay, what's what's going on in this, this container.go thing? And you start poking around and you're like, oh, okay, all right, well, 800 lines of code, that seems about right. You know, that's that's not bad. A lot of commits and a lot of from the same author, that, that might be something we get a little concerned about. And there's a decent number of defects that have been in here and it seems like we touch it all the time. Interesting. And we start to get some trend lines. You know, as an architect, I'm always looking at trends. Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? You know, how are things changing over time? And, and so we can see here that the complexity seems to spike. And I'm guessing there's some refactoring. And then it spikes again and some refactoring. And then it looks like things are kind of getting better. You know, but we also seem to have plateaued a little bit. Now, it's entirely possible that this is just a really hard thing to do. And complexity just is a natural byproduct of that. So I'm, I'm not trying to, to say this is good or bad. It's just something that we might use as a marker to say there's more for us to spoke poke around. I've used cyclomatic complexity since very early on in my career. This is just a fancy way of saying how many paths are there through my code base? How many blocks do I have? Some people would argue that one is the maximum. I think that's probably a little too pedantic to try to do. It's not a bad goal, mind you. I will say that low single digit numbers are your friend. You can see from, from this particular tool, they decide that once you go from four to five, that's when we have a problem. Now, I would argue that once you get into the double digits, you have a serious problem. And that's where I would definitely click over to orange. I'm not exactly sure where it clicks over to orange. But my opinion, once you start seeing these higher single digit numbers, you need to start doing some serious refactoring work. If you do start seeing double digits, that's when you need to start figuring out how do I get off this project? The worst I've ever seen in actual production code was 82. And I still to this day have no idea how a developer sat down and created something that was that ugly, but they did. And not surprisingly, that's where we began our refactoring effort. Shocking, I know. We also can see some comparisons here that un unsurprisingly complexity and lines of code do tend to mirror one another. And then I do think it's fascinating. This must be that, that magic self-documenting code. There's no comments here. You know, what could possibly go wrong? You also start to get a sense of, you know, who's working on what, you know, where is, is sort of that locus of attention? Do we have any sort of single person dependencies? You know, I like to think of that as, as a low lottery number. What happens if this individual wins the lottery? Are we in a world of hurt? You know, and so you start to get some, some really interesting insights into your code base that, that might help you make some changes. Now, again, I'm not trying to pitch specific tools. That's not what I do for a living. You know, I'm sure there's someone else who'd be happy to give you, give you that information. 
But we can leverage our source code management tool of choice. I'm sure all of you are familiar with GitHub in one way, shape, or form. And sure enough, GitHub will tell you an awful lot about what's going on in your code. Like, oh, this hasn't been touched in a couple of years. This was touched a couple of days ago. And so if I'm in a situation where, geez, the last time we committed this code was, you know, one of, one of those super blue blood moon eclipse things happened, it's probably not a good candidate for us. You know, we want to look for those parts of the code base that are always be changing. And then that's the spot that we might want to start doing some deeper research. Your bug tracker can help you quite a bit here. Where do the defects tend to live? That's another thing that, that usually is a pretty good indicator where there's some churn. Look at your backlog. You know, what, what, what do your customers keep wanting you to change? Where are your analysts telling you need some additional attention? Now that's great. We have some candidates, but but what, what, what do we do now? I mean, do we just nuke and pave? I mean, that that doesn't always work, but we rarely have that luxury, by the way. Well, no, this is where we rely on the Strangler Fig pattern to help us out here. Now, this is based on some work that, that Martin has put out into the universe. He was on a trip to Australia and saw this sort of strangler fig uh, moss thing that grows over the tree and, and and subsumes the tree underneath it, as I understand it. And so, of course, that was a perfect metaphor for software. And so this is one of the things that Martin's been, been talking about. By the way, he's kind of tweaked the name from Strangler to Strangler Fig, trying to be a little less, I guess, aggressive, if you want to say. Uh, so this is well known. You know, I, I'm a big fan of this particular approach to software. But the idea here is that we build the new around the edges of the old. And over time, we gradually replace those heritage bits, which drastically reduces the risk of a big bang cutover. I mean, I've, I've done a few of these big bang cutovers in my career and it's, it's, it's like doing the high wire act without a net below you. A lot of risk, a lot of concern, a lot of late nights, early mornings. The biggest complaint I have about these though, at least in my experience, is we spend so many months telling our customers, just be patient. We're almost there. Just be patient. We're 80% we're there. We're 85% there. Just, just hang with us another two or three or six or eight or nine months. And we don't get a lot of credibility because they're like, well, show me something, you know, show me, put something down on, on, you know, get something in production. Let me see it. And so the beauty to me of, of the Strangler Fig approach is that, well, I can incrementally deliver value. I can show them progress and more importantly, they can adapt to that. And they can say, oh, well, now that I see that, you know what actually I really want is this. Now, that's great. I love that approach. But we can actually go a step further and apply data to this process. I spent a lot of my career on, on heritage systems. And we always kind of had this, this conundrum of what would you say the old system does exactly? And I, I can't tell you how many times I've started a project and you ask your customer, well, what do you want? And their answer is, it should work just like the old system only better and then we sit there and we you know pound our head against the table but then you ask well what does the old system do and their answer is well, we're not really sure it's probably fine there's a pretty good chance that you don't actually understand all the nuance of how the old system works that there's all sorts of interesting things that have been patched and fixed over the course of years in some cases decades and and you know my wife who's over my shoulder here She's a business analyst and she will tell you that we never update the documentation after we do one of these patches, after we do one of these fixes, you know, and, and this is just the nature of software. You know, we run into that weird edge case that only happens, you know, once every seven years. I, I very distinctly remember at one point in my career, I helped write this system that we sort of handed over to another part of our company. And then, I don't know, maybe a month later, my director wanders over and says, hey, you know, you worked on the Wombat thing, right? And I said, yeah. I said, hey, they had a build break this morning. Could you help them out? I'm like, of course, but they should just look at the last change they made and, and that'll probably tell them what the problem is. And he said, well, that's the thing. They actually haven't touched the code base, uh, you know, this week. So they're not sure why the build broke. So, you know, I went and looked at their Jenkins instance, saw that it was a failing test went and looked at the test and realized very quickly, oh, this test is going to fail every seven years because there was some weird time thing that only happens, you know, that when a Monday falls on this day or whatever it was. I honestly don't know how I fixed it. I mean, I wrote the test, so it's my own fault, but I may have just really annotated it saying, this will pass tomorrow and this will fail in seven years. And so we do that in code. We, we put in that patch for when month end falls on a bank holiday or when it lines up with this thing or that thing. And, and so we go and fix it and we don't update the documentation, sorry. So we end up in this scenario where there's a lot of unknowns in our code base. So what if we actually had some real world data about how our system works? And so I don't remember which edition of Spring 1 this was discussed at, 
this idea of, well, let's apply data to the strangler fig approach. And so what that looks like in practice is we put a proxy layer between our client and the legacy system. And its first job is just record what's going on. Log, here is the request, here's how we respond. And we do that for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, whatever you need to get confident that we've covered you know, the 90% cases. So this gives us some data. We now know what the old system does and we can use that to drive tests because rarely do these systems have tests. And so now we can go ahead and and tweak that, refactor that, build new functionality, whatever we need to do. And and so the beauty of this approach is I can actually leave that proxy layer around and I can route traffic to both pieces for a period of time. So I can run the new in parallel with the old route requests to both modules. And then I look at the results and if they match, fantastic, everything is good. If they don't, well, let's go with the heritage response. That's still the the system of truth for the time being, but that's gonna log something out somewhere that a human is gonna go investigate later and probably write some new tests. And you know what, there's a decent chance the old system's probably wrong. I mean, it might not be, but, but there's a pretty good chance the old system's wrong. And the next thing we look at is independent life cycles. You know, I've been on a lot of monoliths and one of the phrases that I hear a lot is, you know, we're a big ship. We don't turn on a dime. I get that. Although that does imply we need to start turning sooner than we probably shouldn't wait until the last moment. We, we might need to think ahead a little bit here. You know, if you've ever seen how these massive ships work, you know, they start slowing down, you know, seemingly, you know, weeks in advance of when they actually need to stop. The problem we have today is we have to be more nimble. We have to be able to react more quickly. We need to really embrace that always be changing lifestyle. And so I need to be able to run experiments. I need to be able to do A-B testing. I need to be responsive to the changes that my business partners are seeing. You know, and I think back to the beginning of my career, and seemingly every estimate we gave was 18 months. How long is this going to take? 18 months. And our customers are like, well, well all right, then I guess that's what it takes. Yeah, that, that just doesn't work today. You know, there was too much disruption. There's too many things going on. I need to turn things around in, in hours, days, maybe weeks, certainly not months and, you know, God forbid years. First spring one, I attended as employee during the keynote gentleman got up from Scotia Bank and talked about their journey from the traditional, you know, four releases a year to thousands of releases a month. And to be very, very clear, this is not something that happens overnight. This is not something that you have a meeting on Tuesday and decide, oh, we're going to do this. And by Thursday, we're doing thousands of deploys. It, it takes significant engineering discipline. It takes it takes a culture shift, but it can be done. And what was so interesting to me is at this particular spring one, some of my, my former colleagues were there and we were chatting in the hallway one day and one of them said, oh, Nate, you know, we can't do that. And I said, why not? He said, you worked with us for years. You know, this isn't going to happen for us. I said, did, did you catch the part where the guys from Scotiabank? You know, it's, it, it, it's a bank. You know, that's a pretty conservative organization for good reasons, by the way. But if a bank can make this change, then so can you. And, and the reality, whether it's convenient or not for us today, is speed matters. And disruption is affecting every business. There is no industry that's immune from this. And so if we return to this widget.io monolith example, you know, if our business partners come to us and say, oh, we've got this super exciting new opportunity, but you know, we really need it turned around quickly. I, I need it in days. I need it in weeks. That quarterly release cycle is just not going to do it for me. I can't, I can't wait that long. The opportunity will be gone or a competitor will step into that void. Well, you know what? If we split that out as its own microservice, well, now all of a sudden it can iterate at whatever speed it needs to. It's independent of everything else. It, it has its own repository, it has its own pipeline, it has its own independent life cycle. Now that's good. And what's really interesting to me is we don't just get speed to market. I and mean, that's obviously where our customers are really happy about, but also improves our developer productivity. You know, so having been on a lot of monoliths, I've never been a fan of these seemingly infinitely sized getting started guides, you know, 87 pages. And there's always some weird manual step where, you know, go talk to Kathy and then she'll do some incantation over your laptop and then magically things work. I've been in situations where your build was measured in phases of the moon. I, I was on one app where builds routinely took 24 hours. 
which means you would check code in on a Tuesday and you wouldn't discover you broke the bill till Thursday, which always puts you in that weird situation of, huh, I wonder what I did on Tuesday. You know, what, 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 what was I working on? Can I even get my system back into that state? Probably not. I've been in situations where it takes you months to get up to speed as a new developer, which is not a lot of fun, frankly, as either the developer or the person who hired the developer. You know, and so think about what your was your longest stretch to get someone to be productive. You know, I, I was in one situation where it was considered a year it was about what it took before you got comfortable in the code base. That, that wasn't awesome. Smaller scope means there's less for me to get my head wrapped around. Smaller scope means my builds finish quickly, a minute, maybe less, which means when I break something, we're more inclined to fix it quickly. It can be far simpler to test these smaller things with less surface area. I was working on, on one application and I made a suggestion for a change and my QA lead just stared daggers at me. And like, you, you have some input. And she said, please don't make that change. And I said, okay, well, why, why, why not? She said, if you make that change, I have to spend 80 hours doing a manual regression test and I don't want to do that. I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's, let's find an approach that works a little better for everybody then. I can write a bunch of fine grain tests that run on every commit. I, I don't have to do performance as this one-off, which is traditionally what it's been. And for, for a shocking amount of my career, we do performance tests about six weeks before we went to production. And then we just put the results in a drawer because that's ah, too late. We can't do anything about it anyway. We got to go to prod in six weeks. So, you know, hopefully they won't notice or we'll just, we'll throw more hardware at the problem. That solves every issue, right? It allows us to use the right tools for the job. Now, the unfortunate aspect of, of shared, uh, you know, life cycles means we can only move as fast as our slowest moving part of the organization. You know, I've been on some currency projects before, and it's amazing to me how we get stuck in this rut where we can't upgrade to the next version of Java because, you know, the Wombat app's not ready. And so we have to stay on this incredibly old, crusty version of Java because, well, because. I love the fact that with this approach, I don't have to stick to a one size fits nobody kind of thing. If you've ever seen a t-shirt that says one size fits all, you might look at you and like, who's this all person? Because it doesn't look like it fit anybody. Every microservice can use the right mix of tests that make sense for it. You can use the right linting rules, the right code quality scans can make it so much easier to find your fitness functions. It also means I can actually practice hypothesis-driven development. Now, I love this quote, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. And, and just think for a moment, how much time have you spent in the project room debating possible solutions, saying, well, my approach will obviously result in more sales or, or more signups or more conversions or whatever, whatever metric you care about, but how do you know you're right? And this is where it's just like, well, that person sounds really confident. So I think they must be correct. More importantly, what happens if you're wrong? Now, on the monolith, by definition, we had to be conservative. Now, I, I live in Minnesota, which is in the sort of northern and central part of the states. And that means we have this thing called winter where it gets very cold and, and there's lots of snow and ice. And so we're, we're in summer right now. It's beautiful. Yesterday was gorgeous. I have a hard time thinking in Celsius, but it was kind of, I think, in the high 20s. It was gorgeous. Now, in the winter time, though, in the fall, my son, when he was younger in his, his school, posters would start showing up, reminding the kids to walk like penguins on the ice. Because if you take big, long strides when it's slippery, you are going to fall and you might hurt yourself. You know, hopefully you land on your butt. Hopefully you don't land on your face. And so you have to remind the kids to walk like a penguin. That's how we typically had to work with a monolith because if I was wrong, I just blew a whole quarter. This, this is thousands and thousands of hours of work. So we had to be really conservative. The beauty of microservices, <clears throat> excuse me, is I can actually test my hypothesis. I can do A-B testing for something that for most of our, our career has been, oh yeah, if you're a big tech company, you can do that, but but we can't justify that at you know retail store co. And so I can actually do hypothesis-driven development, which looks a little something like this. We believe this change will result in this outcome. We will know we have succeeded when we see this change in this metric. So we believe adding a distributed cache will result in faster startup times, we will know we have succeeded if startup time is less than 15 seconds.
Now, this can lead us to some very interesting fitness functions. And, and as I alluded to before, this used to be the playground of the Amazons, the Googles, et cetera. And it turns out we can actually all do it now. Because let's be fair, what customer doesn't want a constantly improving product? Now, in order for this to work, however, it cannot be a free for all. It cannot be let a thousand flowers bloom. We need to focus on paved roads. And it's important to understand that this is what goes on even at the most developer autonomous organizations. We have this concept of this is how code gets to production. We know how it works. We know how to support it. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of examples of it working well. If you choose to go on the minimum maintenance road, good luck to you. You travel at your own risk. I hope you brought your snow chains. The other side of this coin is you build it, you own it. This is the piece that a lot of folks miss when they say, oh, but the best part about microservices, I can choose whatever tech I want. Yes, along with that autonomy comes accountability. The other piece of this that you have to remember is how do you get good at something? Well, well you do it. Repetition is your friend. How do you possibly get good at, at releases if you only do them every few months? How can you possibly get expertise there? You know, what I've seen happen a lot is you, you come out of that release weekend and you're like, oh gosh, I don't ever want to do that again. Yeah, yeah, right. No, let's never do that again. But you don't have an incentive to go fix anything because, well, you know, I'm, I'm exhausted from this weekend and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work on it, but I, I, need, I, need, I need a break. And then the next thing you know, you're at your next quarterly release and you're like, wow, we didn't fix anything, did we? You know, this is one of these things I've, I've actually had a discussion with my son about, not, not about software per se, but, you know, he, he's trying to play golf. And I keep reminding him that if you want to get better at golf, you, you need to hit a lot of golf balls. This is not a sport that, that works particularly well if you only play once or twice a month. And, and so we need to get in this mindset of, well, I'm going to deploy early. I'm going to deploy often. And if I deploy dozens of times a day, I will, by definition, get better at it. I will start buffing off the rough edges. I'll start to develop some muscle memory. The other piece of this is you will develop some trust in the process. That's vital. Again, if you only go to production periodically, does it work? Well, maybe, maybe not. If I've gone to production five times today, I got a pretty good idea that this thing works. Now, it's really vital that we have robust pipelines for this. And there's a ton of great tools out there. You know, the vast majority of them now are cloud-based, which is good. You know, if you don't know how to create a pipeline, my spring colleagues have some thoughts here. And, and by the way, we're not trying to own your build. It's just an opinionated build test stage prod flow. And it's just a place to start. You know, you can go ahead and modify it to your heart's content. Now, I am very much of the opinion that independent life cycles are one of the most underappreciated benefits of adopting this particular architectural approach. The most dangerous phrase that I hear, and I hear it a lot, is that's how we've always done it. That just doesn't work anymore. A couple of years ago, I was helping out a client and, and they, they brought me in because they're having a performance problem. And I'm not a performance guru, but you know, I agreed to help you know look at their architecture. And so they're walking me through their approach and, and Basically, what it boils down to is for each one of their clients, they, they get buckets of widgets and they process the widgets and then they, they move on to the next bucket and they do some more processing. And so as they're explaining this to me, I said, well, you know, and, and their problem ultimately was that, you know, they were getting really successful and they had lots and lots of customers with really big boxes of widgets. And so their overnight batch run wasn't finishing overnight anymore. And so I said, well, do, do, does the processing of widget A have anything to do with the processing widget B? Nope, nope, they're totally independent. At the end, we do some aggregation. I said, could, could, you, could you process them in parallel? Could you have a set of workers that just you know, grab the next widget, grab the next widget, and then maybe write that out to a queue or something? And there was kind of this like pregnant pause and then like, you know, ding, the light bulb went off. And, and it was clear like, well, but that's how we've always done it. You know, and as much as I'd like to say that, you know, I had some magic insight, I just wasn't constrained by the that's how we've always done it mindset. I was able to look at that and say, well, could you do it a different way? All right, well, let's wrap up with the reason so many of us are excited about microservices and that's the polyglot tech stacks. The monolith forced us down this one size fits nobody sort of approach. I've been a lot of companies where we describe themselves completely by our stack. We're a Java shop, we're a Ruby shop, we're a .NET shop which is really just another way of saying, I have a big hammer, please somebody bring me a problem. 
And there, there are pluses to this approach. You know, you get some expertise. If you spend a decade on a platform, you usually get pretty good at it. Makes it easier to move teams around, cross pollinate, et cetera. It can make it easier to simplify, easier to simplify hiring or training. It does help our operators. They only have to focus on one kind of environment, but but one size doesn't fit all. Again, if you've ever seen that T-shirt that says one size fits all, I really want to meet who this all person is because it doesn't look so great on me typically. Now, there are some downsides to this. As I said earlier, currency is almost always constrained by whatever that slowest moving app is. And so I'm sorry, you don't get to have nice things because the Wombat app's just not ready for that. And by the way, when we do do an upgrade, oh, it's going to take us months to do it. And by the time we actually get it done, that new version we're updating to, yeah, it's outdated already. Oops. And of course, the reality is very few organizations are truly homogenous and all it takes is a merger or an acquisition and you're not homogenous anymore. You know, we never get involved in the M&A process until it's already been decided and, and the senior people of, you know, the senior managers have already kind of divvied up their bonuses and everything. And it's OK, uh, techie guys make this work. Now, cloud computing does remove this huge constraint of one stack to rule them all because I actually can spin up multiple stacks if I want to. So Polyglot's not this pipe dream anymore. It does let me use my full toolkit. It does allow me to pick the right tool for the job. So I don't have to take the square peg, get my big hammer out and pound it into the round hole. However, there's always a but. We have to avoid technical sprawl. Now, a lot of people realize pretty quickly, they're like, oh, this is awesome. Everybody can use the right tool for the job, except what that means is everybody has their own favorite tool, own favorite language, their own pipeline preference, their own metrics. And, and now you don't have two or three ways of doing it. You've got hundreds of ways of doing it. And where's this unicorn developer that knows Go and Haskell and Java and Ruby and Python and JavaScript? And, oh, and by the way, how many, how many libraries do I need to support all that? And can I stay current on all that? You know, we've all seen the instances of, of these bugs leaking and having, you know, hundreds of millions of people's information spread all over the interwebs. I mean, it's just a guarantee. So we need to have some guardrails in place. It can't be a free for all. There needs to be some guidance here. Now, it could be very broad. It could be use anything you want as long as it runs on the JVM. It could be more constrained. For most of my career as an architect, my job was to tell you, here are one of the three languages you can use. If you don't like that, you're wrong. Again, the focus here has to be on paved roads. This is what goes on even at the most developer autonomous organizations. Here's a well-worn path. We know how it works. We know how to support it. We have lots of examples of success. If you choose to do something that's out of the norm, that's fine. You're, you're able to be able to do it, but you, build it, you own it. You are accountable for the outcome. So sprawl does exacerbate our accumulation of technical debt, which again is why micro is the key word. They should be small. Now we can debate what small means until the proverbial cows come home. Again, I like anything we can rewrite in two weeks or less because if I chose poorly, I lost an iteration that's recoverable. The other piece of this is the longer I've spent on something, the more invested I become. I'm quite certain this is why teenagers actually live through their teenage years because we have so much time invested in them. And we remember when they were cute, cuddly seven-year-olds and we realize, okay, well, they'll become normal again at some point, right? I hope. So it can be challenging then to try to change course, even if we really should. So yes, microservices do give us the ability to choose the right tech for the job, but we have to weigh the pros and cons of this and understand that with great power comes great responsibility. You build it, you run it, you own it. So be very, very careful that you are not engaging in resume-driven design. This happens to the best of us. You know, we, we must use this technology. Why? Because I want to put it on my resume. So yes, microservices do give us some very impressive benefits. They do come at a price. Please do not pay that complexity tax unless you get something in return. So no, not everything needs to be a microservice. We, we should use them where they make sense. We should use them where they add value. So if you need one or more of these principles, and I didn't get to all of them, I apologize, go forth and prosper. And if not, don't worry, there's always serverless. So that probably will work too. I wish you luck. Thank you so much. If you want to see me go deeper on this, I do do a series for O'Reilly occasionally around this microservice approach. So, you know, if you're interested in that, feel free to hang out with me there. I think I've got one coming up soon for some value of soon, but I, I tend to not look too far out of my calendar because life changes rapidly these days. Uh, and if you want to see more with me, I do a Twitch stream on Mondays if you want to hang out as I interview interesting people in industry. And so with that, I will hop out of here and see if there are any questions or comments. Although I guess we only have about 30 seconds. Yes. So. <laughs>
Uh, don't worry, Nate. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, so we have uh, a question from uh, okay. Narmin uh, on YouTube. So he asks, he would like to have your opinion about microservices that have shared databases. Ah, that's an excellent question. So why did we decide, or why does sort of the platonic ideal say, let's not have shared databases? Because integrating at the database hurts, you know, and when I need to make a change, now I break you and you need to make a change and you break me. So integrating at the database level is painful. So let's not do that. So every service has its own database. Well, there's a consequence to that, which says, uh oh, these three services are all working on the same data. And so they each have their own data store. Now I've got to try to, you know, mute that together. And I got to have a service that runs and, and copies things over or whatever. And so that has consequences too. There's nothing wrong with sharing data if I control all of the services. Where it becomes problematic is if I control two services and Bruno controls the other one. And now we're right back where we're, oh, geez, now we got to negotiate and stuff. So, some people call this a service-based architecture. That's usually the way Mark talks about it. But we can't afford to be dogmatic in this industry. We need to be ruthlessly pragmatic. So if the right choice for you and you control all three of these services to have them use the same data store, then, then that's okay. It's not like there's, you know, the microservice police are going to come and give you a demerit or something. You do what's right for you and you know your situation best. So if the easiest, or I should say, if the simplest approach is have them work together than have them work together. Okay. Thanks, Nate. We need to wrap. My pleasure. Uh, our time is up. And uh, thanks very much for uh, being here at Generation. I hope we can see you again uh, in future editions as well. I, I need to come visit you guys in, in the real world. I'm very excited for that. So fingers crossed for 2022, <laughs> I get to come visit you. Fingers crossed. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.